All right, so welcome, Courtney, and uh, so we see your screen, and uh, we're uh, keen to, to listen to you discussing simple neural scaling law. Uh, yeah, so thanks for having me. Um, sorry, I, I couldn't be there. I, uh, I hurt my back really badly. So uh, also, by, uh, I guess, 10 p.m., your guys' time, I will be on the ground with a heating pad and having a glass of whiskey. Um, I assume many of you are working on some neurop things going on. Um, so uh, again, I, I apologize profusely for not being there. Um, so today I'm going to talk about a new paper that uh, hasn't come out yet. It will be out soon um, on scaling laws. Um, this is sort of a complement with uh, what Imbar talked about. Um, and please, please ask questions. This is a new talk. So there's things which are a little bit rusty and um, I love to get some feedback from everyone. Okay, so where does this, uh, what problem I'm gonna be talking about? Well, if we think sort of before large language models and some of these large scale models that we are currently seeing, what we really think of as the limitation in the optimization part of ML is that uh, data is our limit. Right? Uh, we have some fixed data set and that's all we can do. What these large language models and these large scale models came out, what they really have started to show is that, well, we actually kind of have an infinite data set. That is to say that we have all the internet available to us. Okay, so we have all this infinite data. So what is preventing us really from actually solving the problem now? Well, the limitation now is not necessarily data, but actually uh, compute. So this leads to a really natural question. For a given compute budget, how do we best allocate our resources? Like how do we create the model given a fixed compute? So yeah, by the way, please interrupt me with questions. <laughs> um, so let's formalize this a little bit more. So let's consider a sort of general learning problem. So here we're just trying to minimize X in RD we have some expected risk, okay? Here I'm gonna let A be my data, and D is sort of the number of parameters. And if we think about compute, a simple formula for measuring compute is just that compute cost is the number of iterations of our algorithm times by the number of parameters. Now you can add batch in here too. Uh, I won't go through the batch one, but it's just simply number of iterations times number of parameters. Okay, so what was observed and what can we do? So what people were seeing is that, well, you can run SGD for many, many different parameter counts, okay? And what, that's what you'll get here. These are these uh, colored curves on this plot. And because of this formula for flops is equal to number of iterations times by parameters, well, you can plot the loss function now as a function of flops. So that's what I've done here. I've plotted my P, my loss function, as a function of the number of flops. And what they saw was these sort of scale things, these sort of curves. Okay. So this is what people do. They ran a many different Ds, okay, and they plotted SGD, and they got these pictures which look like this. And this is what happens in the large language models too. So then the question becomes sort of if you fix the number of flops, how should you choose your parameter D so that you get the best possible loss? That is to say, okay, let's use this thing as an example. If I fix this gray line, so that's my flop count, okay, what do we see? Well, we see here that if we choose D is equal to 1600, that would be this sort of uh, purple line. Well, it doesn't have that many parameters, so you can run it for a very, very long time because, you know, you don't have that many parameters, so the compute cost is not so bad. But eventually you level out due to the model capacity. You reach some sort of limiting loss. On the other hand, if you choose something like a bigger parameter count, like this green, uh, lime green line, the 51,000, well, it's great, you have as much model capacity as you possibly could want, but because you're limited in compute, you can't run it for very long. So you don't actually solve enough of the optimization problem. 
So the loss value is still very pretty high for this flop. So what we see is that the best loss value for this given flop is this sort of like G is equal to 6,400, at least in this example. And you can do this for all these different flops. And what you get is this curve, this red curve, which is called the compute optimal curve. Right? And what we would like to be able to do, because you know these things are being done now on huge models, things like that, we would like to be able to predict what this red curve is. That is to say, instead of having to run SGD with many, many different Ds, which we won't be able to do for large, large D, we would instead just like to be able to say, here's the best loss you can get for this D print, given this compute budget. Is the question OK? I'm clear. Can't exactly see everyone, so I think it's I'll just, take silence. It's for me, Courtney. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. OK. So what I just described here in this picture is that capacity is kind of the limitation here. Like, the limiting loss value is capacity. But in fact, there can be many other different things that can affect the compute optimal curve, this red line. So what are we going to show? What's the idea? So here I'm going to, the idea here is that we need to create sort of a very simple model that we can analyze where we can actually get enough variety in the compute optimal uh, curve. So we're going to predict the training loss using a simple model, which has three parameters. And we're going to run this on the simple model, one pass SGD. So this model was developed by Maloney, Roberts, and Sully because it exhibits this sort of kind of scaling behavior. So what are these three parameters? These three parameters are going to be alpha, which is going to control the data complexity, beta, which is going to control your target complexity, and you have your D, your parameter count. So what are we going to show? We're going to show that there are actually sort of four distinct looking compute optimal curves, or in other ways to say it, loss curves. But the loss curves look different depending on alpha and beta. So depending on how much strength the data complexity is versus target complexity. Okay, so we're going to look at the phase plane of alpha beta. And there's going to be four, actually seven phases if you really put everything together. This is the biggest phase diagram you'll ever see. Now, what is going to dictate these curves is what I'm going to do is two things. The first is sort of model constraint compute optimal curve. That is to say that it has nothing to do with the algorithm. I could have used another algorithm. It didn't have to be SGD. And I would get the same sort of compute optimal curve. So one of these we just saw is that it one of these things is capacity of the model. That is, you go, you solve your thing until you reach the limiting level. Once you reach the limiting level, what you should have done now is increase D because you're wasting compute if you just keep solving. Now that's completely independent of the algorithm, right? That's just the limit level. The other thing though that can affect this is something called poor embedding of your features. So what you'll see here is that you kind of get an initial decrease. And then because of the way you embedded your features, you, your sort of your signals get kind of mixed in with some noise. And so that you can still solve, like there's still signal, but it's kind of gone mixed. But it slows down your training and it slows it down enough that you waste compute trying to do it. Like it's not good in some sense, as many of us know, to kind of solve through some of the noise, even if there's signal in there. So it's more compute favor to actually increase D at that point. So to not go through that poor, the, those uh, sort of uh, hidden signals in the noise. So it makes sense. And then the last type of thing, which is going to dictate the phases is the actual algorithm itself. That is to say, SGD noise can actually slow you down in training. And so there will be times where SGD is actually important. Right? And in this, for these types of phases, the, uh, another algorithm might actually change the compute optimal curve. And we didn't look at this, 
but uh, it's definitely a cool, interesting area to explore. The other thing that we'll see that's slightly surprising is that for a large portion of sort of this alpha beta plane, the optimal parameter as a function of flops is sort of universal. It just is f to the one half. Don't know why, f to the one half. So there's sort of this universal scaling law which is happening. It is occurring, it doesn't occur for all alpha and beta, but it occurs for a large selection of them. This is something interesting and I think it's been observed this sort of universal scaling law in models, in real models. So kind of interesting to see it appearing even in a simple one. Okay, clear? Any questions? Lost everyone. <laughs> there is actually okay. a question. So I will yeah, yeah. Um, so um, how do you parameterize the capacity of the model with only d like the number of parameters like so does it matter how you are increasing or decreasing the number of parameters like with respect to the width or uh, the depth of the network like the the specific yeah, yeah. architecture <laughs> yeah yeah so i'm gonna uh, this is this idea we're only going to do this on a on a simple model okay so this is like uh I'll, i'm going to describe it in a second here about exactly how I'm doing it. I'm not even doing it on a neural network. This is just going to be basically a random features model. But the random features model, it turns out, has enough uh, move, enough uh, uh, richness to actually still be able to uh, uh, exhibit all these types of compute optimal curves. But kind of okay. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. So. Yeah, it's a great question. How do we actually do, like, what, what is a good model, or what is a model that you can actually even do this sort of thing on, which gives you some interesting behavior, and there's m many different things you could do, but you need something which is at least solvable and analyzable, so that's uh, the first thing. So you go back to your old school stuff, and you say, let's do something like a random feature. So here, what I'm going to do is I'm just minimizing one half the expectation, so sort of of this uh, mean squared loss, where I have some data, which is random, and I'm going to embed it in an RD dimension by a random matrix W. Okay, so V here is, is, is like very big, you should think of, and D is like your embedding. Okay, and because of this random matrix W, I can vary my, my D, but I'm always going to assume because in general, the way we think of language models, that V is way is much, much bigger than D. So this is how I'm going to vary capacity here. And then I'm just going to run one path SGD, which is that at each iteration, I'm going to generate a new data point because I have infinite data and update my model based on that. Update my iterate. So what am I going to assume? So my W here, I'm just going to assume is normally distributed. Okay. For my model, okay, this alpha, this is this model complexity, I'm going to assume that this, this data is distributed like a normal, but with a power law. So it has this j to the minus 2 alpha along its entry. Oh, sorry, this should be a j. It's distributed like normal 0 j to the minus 2 alpha. For my targets, I'm also just going to assume that they're fixed, and they also have sort of a parallel, which looks like j to the minus beta. So beta is going to control my target complexity. Alpha here is controlling my, my model complexity. V is going to be bigger than D, so in the embedding, that's why you get capacity problems. Okay, And what's going to play a big role, and because you guys are high-dimensional polyrandom matrix there is, is this, uh, what is this k-hat matrix, which is formed by taking d, w, w transpose d, where d is just a diagonal matrix where I put j to the minus alpha. So it's a model clear. It's just a random features model where I've put sort of power law on the data and on the target. Okay. And so you can plug in your SGD into your loss, okay, right? So you get this formula for the loss curve. And because you have this compute constraint, which is the number of iterations times by parameters, the goal then, 
to get this compute optimal curve is to minimize in D P where you just re resolve K in terms of F and D. So F over D, D alpha beta. And that's what Jurat gives you this for this red curve. Now this work, this model, and there's other models that you could might think of that you could use. Uh, this model has been looked at once before by um, borderline some Harvard people. Uh, they just did gradient flow. They didn't really look at it, and they sort of assumed a form for their for their loss. So they assumed that their loss decayed like something. Uh, the people who created this sort of uh, random feature uh, scaling law type thing. So that's this model gives you this this picture here. Okay. Was well, this a Maloney Robert Sully? Um, it, these types of pictures have been empirically observed. I mean, I think people have heard of chinchilla, and other people have have looked at this because of its scaling law look. Okay, but without really the compute constraint. So they were just using it because it it exhibits some of the properties that scaling laws have of LLMs. It has this sort of shape to it. Uh, is there any questions? Actually, uh, yeah, can I ask a question, please, Courtney? Uh, yeah. So, yeah, yeah. Um, so this is really cool, but one thing I didn't understand is, so are the labels correlated to the inputs? So are you basically looking at the training loss here, or do you also have a notion of generalization? Uh, so there's, because, yeah, so the way you should think of this is because you're in the infinite data regime and these LLMs, Generalization isn't really the thing you're interested in. Why? Because you never actually get to the point where you've solved the model completely. The D is so big. The compute constraint is sort of the thing. So generalization isn't really the, the question here. Um, hopefully that sort of makes sense. You have to rethink of this. Like you never even get down far enough to really be solving these problems where you're really talking about generalization performance. The other th you're really just trying to solve the optimization original problem. The other thing is uh, the way you should think about these this targets and model. Yeah, it may seem a little bit off, but but the idea is that if you think about it, the eigenvector, the model and targets are sort of related. So the eigenvector one zero zero should be a solution to this this problem because of the power law thing. Okay, so like they are related. Like you you have correct embeddings and stuff. So these two things are related to each other. You can add noise, like label noise, but it just muddles the picture more in the sense that your limiting loss value will depend on that label noise and the whole thing works, but then it's a label noise. Is it kind of clear? They are related. So the targets and the, and the, and the model data are related to each other because the uh, like the eigen, there's an eigenvector here, which are natural. The coordinate eigenvectors are sort of a natural fit. Okay, okay, I see. Thanks. Yeah. Okay, so this is great, but what you actually really need in order to do this problem, to actually minimize this, is you actually need a description of the loss itself under SGD. So what we what we showed is something which is what Imbar talked about too, is that there are some things which are like deterministic dynamics. Now, before I go there, on this problem, it turns out you can do one step better, or one step before that, which is that the expected loss conditioned on the random matrix W actually satisfies an equation. So if I let this K hat again be this D W W transpose D, the expected loss under SGD will actually satisfy a convolution Volterra equation. And the convolution Volterra equation has two terms, a forcing function, which is basically just gradient descent on the original problem, and a kernel term, which is representing of SGD noise. So the kernel is SGD. And from this, just because it's Volterra equations, you get a nice convergence threshold. That is to say, something is convergent, SGD is convergent, if and only if these two conditions hold. Okay, so this is cool. 
but it's still random. And uh, this group is all about high dimensional probabilist random matrix theory. So you might want to say, how can you get rid of this randomness? Well, one thing you can do is you steal ideas from random matrix. That is to say, you replace this random k hat with its deterministic equivalent. Why can you do this? Well, if you look at the forcing and kernel functions here, they're just functions of the resolvent of k hat. So replacing it with its deterministic equivalent, that is to say, we're kind of replacing the resolvent k hat of k hat of its expectation, uh, the resolvent of k hat. <laughs> Um, with a determinist equivalent, meaning that it's sort of like taking the expectation over W of the resolvent of K hat is roughly deterministic. That's sort of how you think of it. If you've never seen these before, it's not quite as that, but it is that. So we replace the resolvent of K hat because the forcing function and kernel are functions of this with this deterministic equivalent. And what you get is that it, that deterministic equivalent satisfies classical random matrix theory type thing, fixed point equations. Random matrix theories love fixed point equations. Okay, so you get these. And what you do is you just replace this deterministic equivalent for the resolvent into this expression for the Volterra and you get a new Volterra, but now it's completely deterministic. That is to say, P of K is some solution to the convolution Volterra of these F plus, F plus K convolved P, where k, where f is a forcing function, where I've replaced things with a deterministic equivalent, and k is the kernel, and still solves, satisfies it, this Volterra. Okay, but now everything's deterministic. I should keep track of time. Okay, so uh, just to show you that this thing kind of works, you can play around with the spectrum of k hat. These are sort of power law distributions of it. You see these sort of bulk things with these long tails. If you were to reorder the eigenvalues, uh, the whole tail becomes these lines and the bulk just becomes a little thingy at the bottom there, which is like curved down. That's all it is. It's kind of funny. Um, CIFAR, like real data, tends to have these sort of power law distribution. So you can, you can plot CIFAR, its eigenvalues, and you'll see sort of the same effect. Um, I just want to say that this Volterra equation, okay, this deterministic Volterra equation is a really good predictor of SGD behavior. You can plot it, you can solve the Volterra equation numerically, and you can show that it really does mimic SGD. So that's what the dashed lines are, and uh, the, the color lines are SGD. Okay, now this isn't enough. Convolution Volterra equations are great, but there's still some sort of numerical sort of ODE type thing. What you really need is something where you can actually get an explicit formula for the loss. So you need to go one step further. And so the idea here is that you can show the, that the solution to this Volterra equation actually basically looks like the forcing term plus the kernel. Okay, so... That's what this is saying. It says that I can sandwich the solution to this Volterra equation by just the forcing term plus the kernel. And now I have something which is very easy because now all I need to do is understand a forcing function and a kernel, and that's it. That will give me a good prediction for the actual behavior of the loss. So what you can do is you can look at the forcing function, and what you can show is that the forcing function basically looks like three terms, F0, FPP plus FAC, and the kernel looks like what I'm gonna call KPP. Now these things have explicit formulas via contour integrals, and in asthmatotics, they look like K, so the number of iterations of SGD raised to some power, D raised to some power. So they have a power law distribution each of the S there, each of these components of S and K. So what are these things? So S zero is just your limiting loss level. It's related to your model capacity, okay? And if you view it in terms of this K hat, it has to do with the point mass at zero. So there is a, a kernel of K hat. What SPP is, 
FPP is like running gradient descent on your outlier eigenvalues. So what you see in K hat are the, these are their, these point masses out uh, here because you have like this parallel distribution. So there are these point masses. And so it's just like running gradient descent on those things. Now, the, what is FAC? <laughs> FAC gets more complicated. What is FAC? The problem is because you've embedded your data via this W matrix, sort of the eigenvector, which is like one, zero, 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 okay, gets a little distorted. It doesn't quite solve things. It creates a little noise as a result. And when it creates that noise, it creates sort of a bulk spectrum to appear. So you can think of it as a little embedded problem that you cause by W. And that creates a continuous, an absolutely continuous part of K hat that appears, okay, which can actually affect the, the loss curve. And what is the, this KPP? Well, you can think of it as just an excess risk due to one unit of FGD noise. So is this okay? Everyone okay with this? Any questions? Lost everyone. <laughs> is it okay? Um, my husband, the random matrix series, said this is the coolest random matrix, this K hat. It's a great problem if you're looking for your students because it has point masses at zero, it has outliers, and it has an absolutely continuous part. And it's not a spike or a, or a, a wisher or wigder. <laughs> so it's got a nice, it's got everything else too in it. Okay. Uh, everyone okay? Any questions so far? Yeah, yeah, yeah. If, if I see any question, I will let you know. We, we... Perfect. Okay. So, as I said, while well, you have these forcing functions and kernels, they dictate the, the whole loss curve. And so, what actually is happening here is really you can think of your loss curve as sort of uh, like the components, FPP, KPP, FAC, these things will dominate at various times. So they have sort of this generic form, P is sort of, you see FPP appearing, then KPP, then FAC, then F0. That's sort of the evolution that happens. But why do you get this funky phase diagram here? Is that for some choices in alpha and beta, some of these components disappear. So for example, let's take phase two. Okay, so in phase two here, for this choice of alpha and beta, KPP is so small it doesn't matter. It disappears. So your your P curve, your loss curve, just looks like FPP, FAC, F0. And this is what dictates those seven different phases. What terms of the forcing function in kernel are actually dominating a different time. And then you can say, well, how do I compute, find the compute optimal curve? Well, because they sort of take this specific form, you know it must, what, what the compute optimal curve must occur as sort of one of the corner points. That is to say where FPP is equal to FAC in this term, or FAC is equal to F0. And you can show that because of everything being parallel, that the optimal for this, this look like something like flops raised to some power. And the optimal parameter, d star, looks also like some flops to some. So again, in each of these phases, the loss, a different portions of the f and k will dominate. That's how we dictate the phase diagram. There's also a region of the phase diagram where there is no power law, and this has to do with capacity. We assume V is bigger than D. So in this region of alpha and beta, your loss level is so high, you never actually solve anything. So you don't see power law. I'm just going to show that this works. You can do this. You can uh, use the theory, okay, Volterra, do a fixed compute, use a theory, empirically generate sort of what the exponent should be for SGD. So that's what the second plot is. And plot it out, and you can see that they, everything actually matches the theory pretty well, even empirically.
So let's go through these phases because they're kind of fun. I won't go through there's seven. This is the seven phases. Never again. <laughs> I'll do seven phases. Um, so let's look at the first phase, phase one. So with phase one, it's probably the simplest. It's what I showed at the beginning. It's just everything is dictated by model capacity. That is to say, your loss curve just looks like FPP plus F0. You just solve, and then you're at your limiting level. SGD noise is irrelevant. Okay. And what dictates the difference between phase 1A, B, and C is just what uh, limiting level you go to. Okay. And so it controls a little bit of the D star. You can plot this and you can see that the theory really does work pretty well here. So the red curve is the theoretical sort of uh, compute off the line. I've shifted off from the return. And it does pretty well. So what about phase two? In phase two, you see that uh, this poor embedding is actually going to matter. That is to say, that the loss curve now looks like FPP plus FAC plus F0. So the cartoonish picture is that you have FPP, you're solving gradient descent on the outlier. Then because of some bad embedding, you get slowed down, that creates your FAC, and then you get your limiting level. You still can solve through that bad embedding, so you get your limiting level, and the compute optimal point occurs where FPP is equal to FAC. So notice here, this is independent of SGD. So these first two phases are completely independent of SGD. Any, they're just sort of model capacity problems. It's because the way we set up our model, this is what's going to happen regardless of the algorithm being employed. This works, it's kind of fun. Again, you can do this with real SGD data, plot it, everything goes through. Courtney, a quick question. So this is done yeah. actually on what yeah. data? Like this is Sorry? on portion of GPT-4 or like the dash? No, 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 this is just uh, the, the uh, yeah. Uh, so the, oh, these dash curves. No, no, this yeah. is just done on this model. So this so is not done features. on any of the language. So the X transpose yeah. W, A transpose beta. Okay, thanks. Yeah, yep. It's just purely done on here. Just to get a sense of uh, the way I, you, I want to think about this is that you want a model where you can solve so that at least you can understand some of the qualitative properties that you might get from the compute optimal. And I think a really cool project after this follow up of all this is to see which things from these qualitative things that from this model actually extend to, to real data. So like GPT-4, say, or something like that. Are you going to talk about that? Because no, uh, <laughs> I'm not. It's oh, a follow-up. You promised uh, I'm not before doing... the beginning. I didn't promise it. I didn't promise it. I, I'm only doing the simple model. Um, but it, I think it's a great, I, I haven't looked at it. I think it's a great question. Like, I think now that we have a way, to, first of all, to analyze these things took a lot of time. So now that you have sort of this idea of what you can actually try to understand which phase in some sense, at least qualitatively, like language models are in. And, and to hint at it, it should be something like phase three. There's reason to suspect phase three. But I, I don't know the answer. Like I haven't looked at it, but there's reason to suspect it. Um, um, it's, and it's a great question. problem. Uh, sorry. Um, about the phase yeah. diagram, I mean, it looks extremely detailed and very clean and nice, but is there any um, observation about any of these phase transitions or these phases existing? Yeah, so um, I mentioned one at the very beginning, which is that, and we'll see this a little bit throughout, there's actually a portion of this phase diagram where the optimal D star, you're kind of seeing it here in phase three, this D star is roughly F to the one half. And it, it isn't just phase three. It occurs in a few of these phases. So uh, a few of these, uh, this portion of the phase diagram. Why is this important? It's sort of like a universal scaling law. 
That is but, to say, sorry, sorry it doesn't to, depend uh, on alpha and beta. Oh, yeah. Um, yes, but oh. um, is there any actual model where you can show the criticality? That it has you mean like on, and, and the, um, that it is actually a phase transition. I mean, here on this model, it is a phase transition. Okay. These are phase transitions on this model. This is exactly computing the phase transition for this simple model. Now, is it true for language models? Maybe not. But qualitatively, what people have, so does that make sense? Like the model that I'm considering throughout is this this random features model if you want to say and on here you can prove everything you can prove this phase diagram completely okay thanks now you get observations from this one of which is this the single this universal scaling law type behavior which seemingly is appeared in empirical things like chinchilla has suggested this Okay, so maybe just to say a few other things. In phases one and two, the algorithm played no role. It, the phase, the optimal compute didn't matter. Where it changed, it was, it was just a model-based problem. The other type of thing you could have is something like phase three, where seeing, you actually see SGD noise appearing. So SGD actually becomes important. That is to say you have FAC plus F0 plus KPP as your loss. KPP is SGD noise. And the trade-off, because SGD noise is sort of slowing you down, the trade-off in the compute optimal for this model is where SGD noise is equal to FAC. So why is this important? This is important because here you see that the algorithm is playing its role. And if you use the Dimford algorithm, you potentially would get a different compute optimal curve. Okay, so this is where the algorithms is actually played. And as I was mentioning, someone was asking me about it. Like if you do this on like real models, it seemingly is that SGD or the algorithms probably play some amount of role in the compute optimal when they empirically do it, okay? And that's why, and they also observe this sort of universal scaling law. That's why this F to the one half, which is independent of alpha and beta, matters. So you can kind of argue in some sense from empirics that phase three is probably where a lot of the language models are right now. Now, I'm not making, I haven't done this, just an observation from what people have said to me about it. And it's a really cool project to see if this is actually true. And everything matches here. I just want to point out that it is really important to consider SGD. So in phase one, we don't expect SGD to be that important. So the forcing function should be a good, just gradient descent should be a good approximation. And you do see that that's true here. So the forcing function is this orange curve. SGD is the blue. It is fairly approximate. In phase three, we expect SGD to actually matter. So the forcing function shouldn't be very good. And you see that. It gives you a sort of a Dimford approximation for the way FGD is evolving. In phase four, you also see uh, uh, FGD noise appearing. Okay. Uh, here, the trade-off sort of occurs. You, you, you occur the w whether FGD noise the limiting loss level or versus the SPP trade-off. Okay, again, you'll see this F to the one half appearing for your D star. Putting these all together, you get good approximation. You really do the compute optimal thing on this model. It matches perfect. Okay, and you can see how when you go through these different phase transitions, how sort of the empirical S exponent, so if you measured F to some power, right, the flops to some power, you measure that, that power, how they evolve empirically, which are these dots, which are SGD measured, versus the theory, 
which is the, the curve. And you see going through phases. So what have I done? I fixed my alpha to be 0 0.6 in the first one. And I'm varying beta by decreasing beta. I would end up going through phase three, phase two, phase one. And so that's what you see. Phase three is the green. Then you go through phase two, which is the orange. And then you go through phase one, which is blue, as you vary the beta. And you can empirically measure everything for SGD. You can do these for different slices. You can also do this uh, so that you go through some of the other phases. So here I fix my beta and vary my alpha. So here I will go through phase two, three, four A, four B, and finally one C. And you see the changing behavior. And you'll notice that it's smooth. I mean, it's, it's continuous, but not necessarily smooth across these phases. And we haven't looked across these phases, like where the phase transitions are occurring. As I mentioned, and I hinted at, there's this unusual effect, that is if you solve for all this, there's a portion of this phase diagram, which the optimal way to choose your parameter to flop is just f to the one half. It's kind of amazing. The last curves all look kind of different, but they all look the same. And so they're in this 1B, phase 3, and 1 and 4A. The other thing to note is that the exponents which control the loss are continuous. But if you look at the D star, they're not actually continuous across the phase boundary. So you'll see some weird jumps occurring. So it's an unusual phase diagram. The last thing I want to see, um, I want to show, me. is a finite D effect. Oh, yeah. Um, I, I got a question, yeah, to that slide, actually. Um, so, like, yeah. did I get that, that you said, like, the scaling of D to the, like, uh, the scaling of D to F to the one half is, like, the best thing we can achieve? Is is that, like... Is, is, is... Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Oh, go ahead, sorry. Um, is like if that's the best thing like this um is is this something you can actually like predict for different model classes or like does that account yeah. like for the random feature model now yeah this is a great question so this goes back it, it's been kind of observed that language like that it, like if you don't that the power law is the same so this like d star that you get on lots and lots of different architectures is roughly the same. Now it may, it might not be exactly F to the one half, like the one half power, but it's been kind of observed or viewed. This is what Chinchilla kind of observed. That it, the scaling law that you get is like sort of independent of the architecture. This is just showing that in here, okay, you know, there are some choices in alpha beta where it's not, but for quite a few, it seems like there is like sort of this independent. It really doesn't depend on architecture, how you do your embeddings, etc. Your target it, complexity, data complexity. On? What? What? What's what's the dependence again? Oh. Uh, here, so the D star. Yeah. D star is just in four phases three. For a and one b is just f to the one half. Like, like if someone gives you a, a fixed compute, you should just square root it, and that's the d you should use in your model. Okay. 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 Thanks. <laughs> that sort of makes sense. Yeah, I, I think. That's, but it's still like the parameter scaling, right? It's the parameter scaling. Okay, yeah. it's the parameter scaling. You're just saying like it's but, independent but, of architecture. So, um, yeah, it's like independent okay. of the architecture. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's like it doesn't. Yeah, which is sort of surprising. Like you might say, like it should depend on the architecture. Okay. I mean that would be a natural thing, right? <laughs> so that's kind of weird, right? Okay. Okay. And, and and this is just for this is just for this random features model. This this. D star is f to the one half, but this idea that this sort of parameter scaling is sort of independent of architecture 
is, is what sort of chinchilla was about. This is what they were observing. So it's kind of a, a phenomenon that we're seeing. Okay, cool. Um, I want to put, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And, and it's appearing in this uh, simple model, which is really cool that we can actually analyze. That's the, that's the other cool thing. About. Um, I'm going to end because I think I'm now over and I, I really apologize. Um, <laughs> this is the last slide, I promise. Um, I wanted to say something about finite D effects. So the first thing is, you know, I had this constant, like my loss is approximately F plus K. Uh, this seems to be pretty good. So that's what this first panel is. The constant is roughly between one and three. <laughs> that's pretty good approximation. Um, I want to say that if you use these sort of asymptotics for F0, FPP, that uh, uh, finite D effects are, are there. And for some of the phases, and for uh, actually for a lot of these phases, if you go and actually run this on like your computer with even with GPUs and things, you will not get the correct exponent. That is to say, you need to take D so large at this point that uh, that you're at the level of compute that is available in all the world to see the exponent, the uh, correct exponent is here. So there is finite D effect. That is to say, as Find ID, it will look like your scaling law has stopped moving and you'll compute some empirical thing from SGD. But in fact, if you do sort of like an instantaneous evolution in D, the slope, you'll see that it's still evolving in D. And you need to go out D big. Like what are these things here is like 10 to the 24. <laughs> That's the size D needs to be to see that the slope, see everything has stopped moving in the exponent. This is big D. And apparently, like today, California just announced some law specifically about D to the 24. I'm not sure if we're at D to the 24, but here we are. So <laughs> kind of an interesting weird thing. So this is just as a, more, uh, as a warning to people who do empirical scaling laws, that it's actually really, really hard to get a good estimate from empirics because things could still be evolving in D. This is just a very a warning, caution. Even for this simple model, you have to take D very, very large, larger than most. And then I'm going to end, I apologize, I know I'm over. I just wanna say thank you for the organizers. Like I said, I'm gonna go lay on the ground in a moment <laughs> and uh, with a heating pad, but I'm very glad. I got to give this talk, and this is a, a paper which isn't out yet. It will be out at like, I guess, 10 p.m. your guys this time. Uh, so um, um, I will end there and say uh, thank you, and if there's other questions. Thank you. So we had plenty of questions. Are there, uh, yeah, there are additional ones. Uh, thanks, that was really fascinating. Um, I just missed some technical stuff, and I was hoping you could help me understand where all of the richness in this model comes from. Um, yeah. So you have this um, Volterra equation, which I think describes the the evolution of the loss, and there's a, a forcing term, which is like not doing SGD, just GD, and then the, there's the convolution that accounts for doing SGD. Is that okay? And then you yeah. Yeah. You, you replace them with their like uh, random matrix ex expectations. Uh, to get a deterministic thing that just depends yeah. on alpha and beta. And then how do you go from yeah. that Volterra equation that depends on alpha and beta to the seven phases? Yeah, so the first, there's one a step in between is that for convolution Volterra equations where the forcing function and kernel are power law behavior, you can approximate the loss of just the sum of the two things. So this is kind of just a, a result of like OD, if you want to imagine it, Volterra equation like ODEs, this is a result from ODE theory that the solution sort of has a very specific form as a sum of two terms, of the two terms. So this removes the convolution now. So now you don't have convolution problems, hmm. which is a, a, a difficulty. Then it just is random matrix theory idea to estimate what is the behavior of at the fourth function in the kernel. Because now they're just some contour integrals <laughs> uh, with resolvents. And you know, you, you just have to understand how 
what this uh, re- deterministic uh, equivalent for the k hat is. So like, what is this fixed point equation? How does it, like, what does its solutions look like? Okay, so, so there are like qualitative like changes the in the, thing. qualitative changes in the spectral properties of the k and the other thing as a function of alpha and beta, and that gives you the seven phases. Yeah, and it's I mean it's surprising in some sense that such a simple model, like a random features model, with just putting parallel alpha and beta on, gives you all these curves. I think that's all these phases and all these different loss behavior. I think that's very surprising. Um, yeah, thanks a lot. It's really cool. And, and, and uh, yeah. 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 Thanks. Is there another question? Okay. Yes, there is. Yeah. Um, thanks for the talk. Very interesting. Um, just, like, one, one very general thing I want to ask, like, if, like, if this is, like, if this is also describing large language models, and what does it tell about the future of, like, improving everything we have today? <laughs> yeah, I mean, so, okay, so I'm not claiming that this is, like, exactly large language models. I'm just saying on this model, this, this random feature. Um, but, yeah, no, I, I mean, I, I think there's a there's a real caution, like I, I sort of mentioned at, this, at the end, there's a real cautionary tale about these finite DFX. So, I mean, what people do in large language models, but the empirical scaling a lot of people do, is they just measure SGD, you know, and try to figure out empirically what, what the exponent is, like what the scaling law is for D. And then use that to extrapolate to give you the next way to generate your, your language model. Like move forward, that's how you should do your parameters, and, and you run it, right? The problem with that is that what even this, what this model is sort of suggesting here is that you, there's a little bit of a warning. You don't actually see d to some power or f to some power that that can still be evolving because of finite d. Like it takes d to be really, really big before you see that effect. And that's a lot of money <laughs> that people are putting in by saying that it, you're already at the point where you're seeing D to some power, F to some power. All right. So, yeah. <laughs> and and if, if you, I mean, if, if you really want, if you can classify how this evolution is looking like and where a language model is falling, a, a given finite D effect, you would say things like Google and OpenAI, millions and millions of dollars. Because it, it, they're right now treating it as power law. They're just treating it as like it's D to some power. But it, it, it might not be. You might not be at that point. Okay. So that's kind of a, a cool thing. Okay, thanks. All right. So I don't see any additional questions. So thank you again, Courtney. Thank you. So that was a perfect talk to end uh, today's uh, session. And actually, that's the end of the day. Thank you very much for coming again today. So we'll meet again tomorrow. Just one uh, remark. We have bet on the fact that the weather will be good enough tomorrow for the event to actually happen. So uh, stay tuned. You will receive a mail uh, confirming the time, but roughly uh, around something like four will go uh, all together or those who wish to follow for some walk and then we'll meet uh, directly uh, at the bar for those who didn't follow around five something like this to have a drink all together to close the event okay so see you tomorrow <laughs>